BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Nid 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. This episode of Black Box Online Radio is brought to you by Rep Sports and Ray's Energy. Are you a fan of energy drinks, protein shakes, and health foods? Well, I sure am. I use the stuff almost every single day. They sell Ray's Energy products at my local gym, but you can have them shipped to your home. Use the coupon code NED075, that's N-E-D-075, for discounts applied at the checkout. The link is in the description box. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Friday. Another Anything Goes Friday. Welcome to the show. Today I will be discussing the book Profile by Mark Hewitt, but just a couple of quick announcements before we begin. The first is that there is a new series on this channel talking about the Texarkana Moonlight Murders of 1946, the story of the Phantom Killer. And those episodes will be coming out every Wednesday. And of course, every Monday is Zodiac Monday, where I talk about the Zodiac Killer. And you're listening to the Anything Goes Friday segment here on Black Box Online Radio. So if you haven't hit that like button and subscribe to the channel yet, now's a great time to do so. If you'd like to follow along with all of these true crime discussions, and share anything you want in the comments section down below. And I would also like to give the reminders that this show is available for free downloads at Launchpad 1. There's a link to that in the description box. You can download the audio version of the program, take it on the go, anywhere and anyhow. If you would like to download the video version, you can use YouTube Premium, but that one you have to pay for. Launchpad 1 is free, and there is always the buymeacoffee.com page. If you would like to support any of these efforts and make a contribution to the show, you can do that at buymeacoffee.com. There's a link to that in the description box as well. And all supporters will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. And the book profile by Mark Hewitt is a Zodiac Killer book, but the first 78 pages simply talk about Not only the Zodiac, but other serial killers, mass shooters, and mass murderers. And that's why I thought that it would be some good material for an Anything Goes segment. And there's a paragraph here that is actually written about both the Zodiac Killer and the Phantom Killer, two uh, serial killer mysteries which I'm exploring on this channel. And I would like to read that for you right now. The Zodiac was not even the first serial killer to target couples in Lover's Lane settings. In the spring of 1946, an American serial killer attacked eight people in four separate incidents, killing five people within a span of ten weeks in and around Texarkana, Texas. He usually killed the male and sexually assaulted the female before murdering her too. He was called the Phantom Killer or the Phantom Slayer. The press named the spree the Texarkana Moonlight Murders because of the location and the time of the attacks. Like the Zodiac at Lake Berryessa, the perpetrator wore a hood to conceal himself and, like the Zodiac, he was never identified. And absolutely, they are two shocking cases, but it really makes you question the psychology of everything, because I said very clearly in the past that I thought that there was a particular link between these two cases, and it wasn't necessarily that the Phantom Killer and the Zodiac Killer were the same person, but it could either be that the Phantom Killer was an inspiration for the Zodiac And I talk about that very frequently on Zodiac Mondays, that I believe that the person who committed the Zodiac murders in the 1960s was using three specific crimes as inspirations. The Phantom Killer, Jack the Ripper, and the murder of Sherry Jo Bates in 1966. And both uh, Jack the Ripper and the 
murder of Sherry Jo Bates, have correspondences that have been written. After the killings took place, the Jack the Ripper mystery, of course, has the Dear Boss letter, the Saucy Jackie postcard, the From Hell letter, and then a bunch of other unconfirmed communications. The Bates case had the Riverside Confession, the Desktop Poem, and the three Bates Had to Die letters. So I believe that there could be some interlocking, or the only other possibility would be that the killer just had very similar psychological patterns. And that is what is explored here in the book Profiled, because it really asks us the question, what drives somebody to kill? What makes somebody want to take another person's human life? And I thought it was um, rather interesting that Mark Hewitt chose to talk about one particular example, and that was Elizabeth Bathory, the blood countess, the woman who would um, more or less think that she had the secret to eternal youth by killing other uh, girls and bathing in their blood. That's how she gets the name the Blood Countess, and I'm sure there's a lot of exaggeration and misrepresentation of the details. But what would drive somebody to do something like that? And I think in that particular case, one thing that um, drives people to kill is not caring about the consequences and not caring about society. Maybe they think they're in an untouchable place, or sometimes people know that they're going to get caught. They just simply don't care. There's a certain indifference to the rules and legality and also moral and social conventions and that is very present in the way that serial killers are thinking. And to share some very basic observations that I've had about serial killers in the past that are outside of the book profiled by Mark Hewitt, I believe that there is some type of rejection that this person has experienced in their youth when they feel that they are inadequate, they are not accepted, and they're also traumatized. And then once they can actually overcome whatever abusive state they're in, they try to integrate into society, but they feel that they are so unworthy that they reject everyone around them, but they don't show it immediately. They try to blend in and make people think that they're harmless, and they choose to release their destructive tendencies at calculated intervals. The Zodiac and the Phantom Killer would be Excellent examples of that, and I absolutely think that Elizabeth Bathory, the Blood Countess, would even fit into that. That's all about calculated intervals, because she had such a specific motive for that. An example of someone that would not be committing an uncalculated, or that would not be committing a calculated interval in an uncalculated way, would be someone experiencing a psychotic episode and murdering someone, because the ability to calculate would be lost. But there are many different types of murderers out there, and not everyone who commits a murder of two or three or four people is a serial killer. And as you move on in this section here in Profiled, um, I'll, actually I'll just read it for you. Within the FBI, murders at a single time and location are first categorized by the number of victims. For one, two, or three victims, the events are labeled a murder, double murder, or triple murder, respectively. When more than three people are killed, the event is called a mass murder. But, again, people might be thinking instantly about mass shooters, but they also have a discussion here in the book, I should say Mark Hewitt has a discussion here in this book, about what if somebody were to do something different, like commit the act of filicide, murdering one's family. And he uses the example of John Emile List. John Emile List was an accountant who lived in the New Jersey area in the early 1970s with his family in a 19-room Victorian mansion named Breeze Knoll. He carried himself with an air of success as the vice president of a Jersey City bank, but his home lifestyle and expenses were so extravagant that he could no longer afford them once he lost his job because he was too proud to admit to the members of his family and his friends that he was unemployed. He dutifully arose each morning, dressed in a suit and tie, and set out, implying that he was going to work. But he had no job, and soon his depleted finances gave away his charade. He was also faced with the challenge of dealing with his alcoholic wife's unreared venereal disease, which had rendered her a virtual paranoid recluse. The combined stresses in List's life eventually broke him, List became a family mass murderer when on November 9th of 1971 he killed his entire family. 
And I'll jump ahead to one particular thing here. List eluded capture for more than 17 years. He had absconded to Colorado where he took the name Robert Clark and he later moved to Virginia. He became a model citizen, though, marrying and attending church and making a whole new set of friends while on the run. And I think that that is very important. Um, this whole concept of something drives people to kill, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it is present there all the time. People are always asking these questions. Why did the Zodiac Killer stop killing? Why did the Phantom Killer stop killing? And I simply believe that Actually, it's not even that I believe this. We can observe this in countless true crime cases about when people reach a cooling off period, they do not necessarily reinvigorate their homicidal tendencies because every person is different. And this could do with genetic variation. This could do with lifestyle and circumstances. Maybe the person is always capable of murder until they are too old and feeble to do so, but they don't always act on these destructive tendencies. This guy became a model citizen. And you might be looking at the title of this episode and be thinking that, well, he's not a serial killer or a mass shooter. And the answer is no, but he still was a homicidal individual. And you might be uh, recognizing this name, John Emil List, because they did one of the more famous episodes of Forensic Files about him. And that was one where a forensic artist truly captured all the details of this guy and how he would have gone to great lengths to change his appearance, and it turned out to be all completely accurate. But there's an important distinction that we need to make about how and why do ordinary citizens choose to become homicidal individuals? What actually drives somebody to commit murder? And I definitely think that not caring about punishment or there's no fear of punishment is a very big factor, but there are other variables and I frequently quote Dr. James H. Fallon, who's the author of The Psychopath Inside, when he says that there are three major characteristics that are commonly found in serial killers. One is genetics. There is something in the genes. The second is neurological functioning, like the way that their brain is operating, neurochemistry, very precisely that somebody is going to be acting on desire, but they're not going to have the same emotional response that a normal, healthy, functioning human being would. And when they act on their desires, it fuels their excitement, but they don't feel any empathy for the person whom they are attacking. And the third one was child abuse, that he really believed that abuse is actually the most significant factor out of those three, genetics, neurological functioning, and abuse, that abuse is what truly would drive people to kill. I am also the host of the Zodiac Killer Channel's interview with the expert series, and I had the opportunity to interview both Mark Hewitt and another writer named Soren Korsgaard, who wrote America's Jack the Ripper, the definitive account of the Zodiac Killer, and the first edition title was America's Jack the Ripper, the Crimes and Psychology of the Zodiac Killer, and I shared James H. Fallon's observations about serial killers with Soren Korsgaard, and what he said to me was that there's an additional component that should be added to that. And that is the belief system or the hierarchy of values. And I'm paraphrasing, but what he meant was that someone has convinced themselves that there is a particular type of justification for their destructive behavior. Because in all of these examples, mass shooters, mass murderers, serial killers, this person appears to believe that they deserve to commit these types of actions or they have a reason why they are doing this, and they believe that there is some type of appropriateness that is in these specific behaviors that are associated with killing people, as horrendous as that sounds. But this person thinks that they have the right to do it. And I now follow the channel Playing With Fire here on YouTube, and the host of that is named Alex, and he shared um, something that I thought was a very mainstream definition of the term sociopath and narcissist. Not clinical, not scientific definitions, not even psychological definitions, but what he said was that a sociopath and a narcissist are used very frequently in the English language, and people think of a narcissist as someone who does mean things to people, sometimes even destructive things to people, but they believe their behavior is justified. 
And then a sociopath is someone who does mean things to people or destructive things to people. They believe that their behavior is justified, but they enjoy committing these destructive actions. And of course, that's not a clinical definition of sociopathy. But, but I totally understood what he was talking about. I have an episode here on this channel, one of the older black box recordings addressing that subject called Sociopaths in the Media, when more or less I said that when some people use the term sociopath, they actually just mean that somebody is a big jerk. But I think that there is some value in that statement, because that's how a lot of people perceive this concept. But think about it, though. It's all about indifference to other people, justifying one's own actions, as well as some people get a sense of enjoyment out of inflicting pain upon other people. And that ties into the neurological functioning aspect specifically the um, relationship in the brain between the amygdala, which deals with the emotions, and the orbitofrontal cortex, which is going to be dealing with acting on desire. So somebody acts on the desire, and they do not have the type of emotional response that the normal, healthy, functioning person would experience. And the thing that I brought up from the brain of the serial killer that I always talk about, that's an older episode of BBOR, where I responded to a documentary about serial killers and how their brains work, is that a psychopathic or sociopathic serial killer on average has an amygdala in their brain that is 17% smaller than a normal functioning human being, and someone who has almost zero sociopathic traits has an amygdala that is 8% larger than a normal functioning person. The amygdala is very powerful. So, in short, someone who has almost zero sociopathic or psychopathic traits would perhaps have somewhat of a more elevated emotional response, and that is going to be dealing with things like empathy and dealing with things like, how about sympathy and compassion as well? And in the book, profiled by Mark Hewitt, there's also a brief discussion on John Wayne Gacy, who was known as the killer clown because of the clown makeup that he dressed up for his particular character, known as Pogo, and this is from page 23 in the book. Born in 1942 in Chicago, John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown, was a textbook example of a serial killer. He was the second of three children and the only son. His father was a physically abusive alcoholic. He sexually assaulted and murdered at least 33 teenage boys and young men between 1972 and 1978 in his Chicago area home. Gacy was not suspected in the disappearance of the youths, some whom worked for his construction company. He was therefore able to emotionally cool off long enough to bury the bodies under the crawl space of his home. And it's also important to note that Gacy did dump some of the bodies in a nearby river. Weeks or months would elapse before he would seek out his next victim. Gacy was apprehended on December 21st of 1978. He was found guilty of the 33 murders for which he had been accused of. And after languishing on death row for 14 years, he was executed in Illinois by lethal injection on May 10, 1994, at the age of 52. With um, John Wayne Gacy, though, there are several components that could have driven him to kill. We have to remember the psychopath inside James Fallon and state that abuse could be the most significant factor. And you heard that he was heavily abused by his father, and John Wayne Gacy's own sister even gave a testimonial, more or less, for a TV show, when she said that their father would beat them with a leather strap, and he was relentless. He never listened to their cries or pleas for him to stop. He was just absolutely indifferent to their well-being. And then John Wayne Gacy went on to be a serial killer that would target males or young um, boys, even for, for example, young adults, too. And someone um, named Joy Bradford, a loyal listener to this program, said that her take on the subject was John Wayne Gacy was a bisexual, but he was also ashamed of his bisexuality, and that could have been a contributing factor. And I do think that shame and um, embarrassment, all of these factors come into play because there's a very famous line out there that psychopaths and sociopaths and narcissists, what do... How do all, how all of these terms related? All sociopaths and psychopaths are narcissistic, but not all narcissists are sociopaths or psychopaths. And you can use the model from Playing With Fire about 
that very general mainstream pop culture definition, or you can just simply look at the indifference to human life that is the commonality among them all, or just someone who is doing actions that fuel their own excitement or their own willpower. And someone introduced me to the concept by saying this, and an actual doctor, mind you, saying that if somebody had narcissistic personality disorder, that meant that they could do no wrong, that they think that their actions are what always justified, or there's nothing wrong with the chosen actions that they are committing. That's why this person is mentally ill, and that's why they are experiencing these types of behaviors. But um, I do have to uh, give credit to Mark Hewitt for introducing me to a particular case that I had never heard of before. That was called the Texas Tower Shooter. This is the case of Charles Joseph Whitman. And the most basic introduction on him is that he was an American mass murderer who became known as the Texas Tower Sniper. On August 1st of 1966, Whitman used knives to kill his mother and his wife in their respective homes and then went to the University of Texas at Austin with multiple firearms and began indiscriminately shooting at people. And then he died on that same day, August 1st of 1966. That is something that is also found very frequently when dealing with mass shooters that they might say that they have reasons, they might say that they have particular motives, but almost always the, the motive is just selfishness and destruction, and this person believes that there is some type of justification for unleashing their destructive tendencies on humanity. Last week on the Anything Goes Friday segment, I was talking about Jake Davison, the Plymouth shooter from the United Kingdom, and he also did something very similar. He murdered his mother, first and then went on a shooting spree rampage with a pump-action shotgun in the UK. And another example of this would be Elliot Roger, the Isla Vista shooter, who said that he had all of these reasons for committing the mass shooting, which ultimately led to his suicide. But the real reason was just wanting to unleash destruction on society. He said that it was because women didn't love him, women didn't appreciate him, that they should, but they don't. He said he was doing it because he was a virgin, and not only is he called the Isla Vista shooter, he's also called the Virgin Killer, but I absolutely hate that name. And he even talks about the current movement called incels and voluntary celibates, and the connections between them and Elliot Roger. But all of that was meaningless, because as one psychological profiler pointed out, he killed his three roommates whom he lived with by knife, the same way that... um. Whitman did, the Texas Tower Sniper, and that that had nothing to do with his movement. He did it out of selfishness, and some one of you guys wrote into the comment section last week on the episode about the Plymouth shooter saying that these mass shooters just simply want to unleash as much destruction as they can on society, and that's the focus of that. And the Aurora shooter, uh, James Holmes, he even talked about how he had contemplated becoming a serial killer, and he um, had heavily thought about it, except that he thought that there wouldn't be as many victims as committing a mass shooting, so that's why he chose to do that. And I do completely admit that there is an element of sexual frustration that creates a certain amount of misery in the lives of people, particularly men, but when they're talking about a justification for killing people, Almost certainly that person has a pre-existing mental condition where they believe, much as Soren Korsgaard said, that there's some type of justification for their destructive actions because it is realigning their hierarchy of values, but doing it in an inappropriate way, and they think that they have every right to do this, but in fact they do not. They're committing immoral and illegal actions. But it's always um, interesting when, to note when there are these cases when someone targets particular victims whom are close to them first because it's revenge. They feel that this person has ruined their life, therefore they have the right to take another person's life. And with the case of Whitman, the Texas Tower sniper, he killed his wife and his mother in different places. Mind you, they didn't all live in the same house. He actually went to 
the, his mother's home, as you heard in that little uh, segment there, in their respective homes, and he killed them by knife. And I was uh, also talking about a fictional TV profiler that was played by Kelly Martin in one movie when she said that when someone is stabbed by knife, that suggests that there is a personal and familiar connection. And I would um, like to move on to another segment that is on page 32 here in the book when Mark Hewitt is talking about the classifications of murderers. And it says, Currently all murders are classified by the FBI according to their primary motive. Serial killers are merely one classification of murderer. The classifications are as follows. The first category, a criminal enterprise murder, is one that is carried out for monetary gain such as insurance or assassination for profit when performed with groups. Criminal enterprises include gang killings, contract killings, competition killings, and politically motivated killings. And this is very important to talk about because with serial killers and the term serial killer, that is almost always used for a crime where murder is the primary objective, gang-related shootings or, dr or drug-related shootings or contract killings, those are indeed murders, but they don't fall into the definition of serial killer because the motive, as described by Mark Hewitt here, and the FBI, that is, is um, a criminal enterprise trying to obtain profit or power in some way. And it doesn't even have to be for profit. As it, as we said very clearly, assassination is also listed here as a possible um, possible ca categorical fit. So that has nothing to do for, with, with money, but that could even just be trying to eliminate a particular rival for power. The second category based on the motive is emotional, selfish, or a specific cause, murder. These include self-defense and compassionate killings. When someone is threatened or feels threatened, he or she may choose to fight back and kill the one who is making the threat. While it may be easy to justify, a self-defense killing may nevertheless be unlawful. Compassionate killings which fall under emotional, selfish, or specific, cause-specific murders may likewise be illegal. And a very clear example of this, I think, is the case of Gypsy Rose Blanchard, sometimes pronounced Blanchard. And um, Gypsy Rose Blanchard was being heavily abused by her mother, Dee Dee Blanchard, in a case of Munchausen syndrome by proxy, where she was more or less being poisoned, but she was being deceived into thinking that she had both cancer and muscular dystrophy. She was forced to use a wheelchair at all times, and she was more or less her mother's cash cow, whom she was using for profit, and Gypsy Rose Blanchard more or less orchestrated her murder by by proxy as well, by using another person named Nick Godijan to murder Dee Dee Blanchard, and he got life in prison without the possibility of parole, and she will be out of jail in uh, just a few years now, actually, maybe more than a few, maybe six or seven years left on her sentence before she is released from prison, but she was fighting back against someone who was abusing her, and not only that, but just all of the manipulations associated with it. She ran away once and went to another guy, but then her mother showed the person that Gypsy Rose Blanchard's fake birth certificate, showing her age being younger than she actually was, and that person let her walk out because he didn't want to get involved with a minor. And she was just doing all of these abusive things to her daughter, unnecessary operations. She had her salivary glands removed, and it was so controlling. And the amount of psychological abuse that Gypsy Rose Blanchard would have experienced is very real. And it it is absolutely saddening. But then the way that um, she chose to respond to the situation was also destructive. And much as it says in the book profiled here, that would be an example of someone who was fighting back against an abuser, but they did so in such a destructive way that it became an illegal or immoral action in its own right. And then the book goes on to say that there is a third and final category of murderer by motive, and that is the sexually motivated killer. The murder may be the result of or done for the purpose of engaging in sexual activity. Telltale signs of this category may include dismemberment, mutilation, or something else understood only by the perpetrator. And I think that that's a very, um, very big definition for a sexually motivated serial killer. And I think that that is going to tie into something that is mentioned 
very um, clearly in one of the later parts of this early section in the book, talking about the power assertive personality. Because back in 2019 on Black Box Online Radio, one thing that I talked about very frequently was the um, trinity of true crime deviants, right? Money, sex, and power. The three reasons why people commit crimes, right? Money, sex, or power. That's what people will say. You watch those shows like Forensic Files or maybe Dateline 48 Hours. Or maybe if you're just a fan of true crime podcasts. I used to listen to The First Degree a lot. And then, of course, there's the Serial Killer podcast hosted by Thomas Fibor Thune. And whichever um, show that you like, you must have heard that phrase at some point when they say there are three reasons why people commit crimes. Money, sex, and power. But which one is the most important? And that is power. Absolutely. That is a bigger motivation for people to commit crimes, because even with the case of Gypsy Rose Blanchard, that's trying to get her life back. She wanted the power. Or the um, case of John Emil List, he wanted power over the situation. The Texas Tower sniper, he wanted power over the people whom he felt had betrayed him. The same with the Isla Vista shooter and the Plymouth shooter and the Aurora, Colorado shooter. Those crimes were not necessarily done for profit. In fact, most of them were not done for profit at all. And then there is the concept of sex. Now, is there some type of sexual thrill that people get out of being power assertive or being dominant? Yes, absolutely. But that doesn't mean that they are sexual acts in themselves. And you can see this so many times with serial killers. There will be sexual acts that are committed but they aren't done directly. Like, for example, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, someone whom Mark Hewitt likes to discuss very frequently, he is somebody who committed sexual actions with his crimes, but he didn't even touch the victims at all. He was the Unabomber. He mailed in bombs. He's committing the crimes from a distance. But the crimes were still sexually motivated. And one thing that I heard about Mark Hewitt, from Mark Hewitt when I interviewed him on the Zodiac Killer channel is that he said that what Ted Kaczynski would do is he would spend a hundred hours assembling a bomb that would take nine hours to assemble, and that he would assemble it and then disassemble it and then assemble it again and over and over again because they could only determine that he got some type of sexual urge and thrill from the action of assembling the bombs something that is sexually motivated, but not directly connected to the act of killing itself, or not even directly connected to the physicality of killing. Another example of this that Dr. Todd Grande brought up was David Berkowitz, the son of Sam Shooter, saying that he was a sexually motivated killer, even though he wasn't making physical contact with the victims. And some people even believe that the Zodiac Killer was a sexually motivated serial killer, even though he wasn't making contact with the victims other than very little contact at Lake Berryessa or the Paul Stein murder on October 11th of 69, because he was just getting off on the power, the thrills. And the Zodiac openly made sexual references in his letters. Perhaps the most famous one is that um, to kill gives him the most thrilling experience is even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. So this seems to be something that is very much... Um, aware about how some people get off on power. And even if it comes in a destructive way, the mass shooters, the serial killers, the mass murderers, the person who is even rebelling against someone who is genuinely wrong to them, they get off on trying to respond to people who have hurt them in some way, and they want to take advantage of the situation, and they also want to commit a destructive action in response to a destructive action. But if you ever heard the expression, fighting fire with fire leads to more fire. Now, there's a section here in the book profiled about something called the McDonald Triad, which I wasn't exactly familiar with before with this exact name, but let's um, read this here. Three activities, bedwetting beyond an appropriate age, Pyromania or arson and violence toward animals are called the McDonald Triad, and they've been suggested as correlating with violent behavior, even if only one or two of these are present in the history of the offender. Serious study has produced mixed results for this theory in 1963 by psychiatrist J.M. McDonald. These activities do seem to correlate with violent behavior, especially serial violent behavior. It may instead be, as pointed out by some, that 
researchers also think that the triad correlates well with children who have experienced childhood neglect, and it is the neglect or abuse that, under circumstances, prompts people to pursue a life of violence. And um, I, there are so many ways we can respond to this. Firstly, I was aware of this thing about bedwetting and pyromania and um, abusing animals. Those are the three common characteristics that are found in serial killers. I just wasn't familiar with this exact term for it, that it is called the McDonald Triad. And um, it has been shared in a lot of other true crime shows, on more or less under different names. But I definitely don't think that it's going to be found in everybody. And... I think that serial killers are horribly inconsistent. Like, you have heard this thing before about how serial killers must be pattern-based, and they must be pattern-oriented. They commit their first crime perhaps even unintentionally. Maybe it's from a dispute or an altercation, or they murder somebody maybe even in a calculated way, and they get away with it. And then, that means they learned how to commit a crime. So they develop a pattern of behaviors maybe stalking a victim in a particular way, committing the crime quietly, and they're able to exit. So that le leads them to this life of crime where they know how to commit the murders, they know how to get away with it, and that's how their pattern forms. And they keep doing the same thing over and over again because it is successful. Right? Right? Wrong. Yeah, that is definitely a common myth that has been presented to us by the media. Serial killers are horribly inconsistent. They will use methods all the time for practical reasons. Or if their killings get interrupted, they will murder somebody in a different way. I mean, I really don't think that there's too much credence to this whole idea of a pattern-based serial killer. Instead, what I would propose is that serial killers are predatory individuals. They're committing these types of crimes because... They want to get away with it, and their predatory instincts are telling them that if I act this way, I'm going to get away with it. And then if, if they believe that they are no longer able to commit the crime successfully, their instincts are telling them, if I keep doing this, I'm going to get caught. So that's why many serial killers stop killing. It's just the fear of getting caught. Heightened predatory instincts. And some people can be extremely abusive and also be serial killers. And I believe it was um, Dr. Todd Grande as well who used this term, predatory and parasitic, like someone who is abusive to his family but is also a serial killer, predatory and parasitic. But when it comes to the overall psychology of serial killers and mass shooters, the first thing that I think is most important is this person wants to unleash destructive tendencies on other people. And the second one is that they want to recreate the destructive behaviors that happen to them. Dr. Julie Armstrong talks about this a lot when she says that the serial killer wants the victim to feel fear because they were afraid as a child. They want the victim to feel pain because they felt pain as a child. And they want people to feel misery because they felt misery as a child and that that's just it recreating the type of experiences that they had when they were young and bringing about pain and suffering and misery to other people is recreating the cycle of destructive behaviors and the thing that i used to talk about all the time in the past on this channel was someone can be broken emotionally someone can be broken spiritually, or someone can be just broken in terms of their mental state, people who have been through very severe abuse in cases of trauma. And I often use the example of the broken bottle. If you were to take a glass bottle and smash it on the ground, and it would, it would break into a thousand pieces, but somehow you were able to collect 500 of the shards and you can glue it back together and now you have half of a broken bottle well that's still a broken bottle and that's the way that i would view serial killers because they get their lives together in some ways and many serial killers are people who operate businesses many serial killers are people who 
have careers. They are very sociable. We talked about John Wayne Gacy. He would host parties. His 4th of July party was perhaps the biggest. He was very involved in local politics. John Wayne Gacy was a Democrat, and Ted Bundy was a Republican. Serial killers don't care about any of that stuff. It's all a facade, and they are equal opportunity offenders for everyone. But there was this meme out on um, Facebook talking about Oh, you're watching a serial killer documentary on Netflix, a serial killer who spent all of his time alone, just like you. Not necessarily, really. Many serial killers are very sociable, and they have all types of interactions with people because they're so good at putting on the particular facade, this fake life that they are living. Mark Hewitt even mentions BTK in this book, Dennis Rader, and he called that way of blending into society cubing, that it's not just somebody has a mask on and they take off their mask and this is their true identity, a metaphorical mask that is. He would say that there are 12 different sides to his personality, Dennis Rader did, and that he would just act different ways at certain times. When he would go to church, he acts like a churchgoer. When he was at work, he would act like a worker. And when he was a serial killer, he would act like a serial killer. And I have several episodes on this channel about BTK, including a response to his confession, which has been shared online. Absolutely terrible things that he did to people, but that is more or less how serial killers are functioning. They become very good at putting on the gentle facade and then unleashing their destructive tendencies at calculated intervals when people are not expecting it. And another example that I often bring up is Roger Reese Kibbe, the I-5 strangler, who came from an abusive childhood, an abusive household, and he ended up marrying a woman who was also said to have been very verbally and emotionally abusive, the same way that his mother was verbally and emotionally abusive. And people were just, like, very surprised to learn about that. But that just simply tells me that that's the way that he learned how to behave. That's the way that he learned how to respond to situations. He would accept the verbal and emotional abuse at face value, and then he would wait until he was alone at night during very specific times, and then he would go out and murder other people, particularly women. And something that um, has been expressed in a very similar way is the story of the Golden State Killer, Joseph D'Angelo. And uh, this was um, a view that was shared by Anne Penn, who's the author of Golden State Killer, Zodiac Solved, as well as Serial Slaughter. And she said that um, the Golden State Killer's wife, um, Sharon, was also said to have been what she called hell on wheels, a very emotionally and verbally abusive woman as well. And you would think like a serial killer who's a home invader who's primarily targeting women but also going after men for the sake of convenience is going to be marrying a woman who is emotionally and verbally abusive the same story the same setup living in that particular facade making people think that they are something which they are not and unleashing their destructive tendencies at calculated intervals that is a very big difference between someone who is a psychotic killer who doesn't really have any control over their mental faculties. That is why people who are experiencing psychotic episodes can be found not guilty by mental disease or defect, even though they might still have overcome their episode at the time. But they, at the time they were psychotic, they are found not guilty by mental disease or defect. And a very clear example of that one was Anders Berin Brevik, the uh, Oslo Norway bomber, and then the Utoya shooter. He committed both of these crimes in one day, which left 77 people dead in Norway, and some people even refer to that as Norway's 9-11. But he really wanted to be found sane because he said that he had a motive and a manifesto that was attached to his plan, and one of the absolute worst mass shootings ever in recent memory. But with Anders Bering Brevik, he didn't want to be labeled as a psychotic. He wanted to be labeled as someone who actually had a motive and something that he was standing for. And to be clear, he was not found psychotic. He was determined to have been a narcissist. But I think that what's very important with that is that has nothing to do with a motive. That has nothing to do with any type of manifesto. That is about what power. That is about somebody who's trying to demonstrate that they have more power than somebody else. And someone from his uh, past, whom he knew 
who knew Anders Breivik when he was younger, stated that he talked so much in his manifesto about how he wanted to have a Europe that was free from Muslims, but the re only time he ever saw Anders Bering Breivik angry was when a girl preferred to be with a guy who was Muslim over him, like she wanted to be the girlfriend of um, a, a, a guy from Pakistan rather than to date Anders Bering Breivik, and he thought that that was possibly the triggering event in his life, saying that it was the only time that the guy ever showed any real um, anger or hatred or resentment towards somebody else, and that ties back into the sexual angle, money, sex, power, but um, power seems to be the first and most important reason why people commit these destructive actions. M money seems to be more or less in the last, and that would leave sex in the middle, so they can go power, sex, money in that order, and there can be interlocking motives there. And uh, one final point that I didn't read in the book Profiled. My own observation that I use here on Black Box Online Radio about serial killers and criminals and mass shooters absolutely is, this person believes that their life is terrible. They want to end it. And by end it, I mean the terrible situation. Some people are going to commit suicide, such as these mass shooters that go on to kill themselves, but other people do not. And even the people on forensic files who murder their partners for the insurance policy, whether it's a husband or wife, sometimes a business partner, and they know that they're going to get caught. They know that they're going to go to jail, but they just want out. They want out of their miserable life, and that's why they commit these murders, because they just want someone to notice them and to recognize that their life was terrible, and even if they're in jail... They're free from the destructive life that they were living, emotionally and mentally destructive lives, that is. Although you're going from one prison to another, the mental prison in the free world, to the actual prison in a world that is not so free. And it is not a strong-minded thing to do. It is not a good thing to do. That's very bad. But I don't hear anybody describing the situation in that exact manner, but perhaps they... Uh, they could think of it that way. Serial killers are very selfish. Mass shooters are very selfish. Mass murderers are very selfish. And I really don't think that any type of particular belief system is fueling this other than one person's own desire for power and for sex and for money. That's what these crimes are about. And it's just materialism. And sometimes people are genuinely deranged. Sometimes people genuinely have very intense mental illnesses that are affecting their judgments. As I said, Anders Bering Breivik was found to be an extreme narcissist, but he wasn't a clinical psychotic. And sometimes people are clinical psychotics who are not currently undergoing psychotic episodes. We experience these types of theories all, all the time in the Zodiac Killer mystery with some of the major suspects. Ted Kaczynski even was determined to have been a high-functioning paranoid schizophrenic. So I think that Mental factors are one thing in play, but most of the people whom I've been discussing in this episode had the awareness that what they were doing was illegal and immoral, and they chose to do it anyway because they did not care about the consequences, they did not care about punishment, they weren't afraid of the system, they simply wanted to unleash the destructive tendencies upon society because they felt that they were entitled to do so. They felt in their own narcissistic way that they had a justification for these particular actions, and that was why they chose to commit murder. So that's the conclusion of my episode here, but you can share anything you want in the comment section down below, going in all different directions here today, but I would love to know what you guys think about any of these examples that were discussed here in the book profiled by Mark Hewitt, and... um this is actually part of a trilogy, Hunted, Profiled, and Exposed, and I will be discussing some more of the Zodiac Killer aspects in the book Profiled on Zodiac Monday. But you can also write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can follow the show on Facebook and Instagram. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always BlackboxNed88 for the bonus podcast over on IGTV, and I will see you over there. Until next time.